some of my more distinguished uh, guests, uh, very hot, highly sought after dialogue. Go on and introduce yourself, sir, even though you got your title on your shirt. I'm Curtis Schoon, SchoonTV.com. Visit the site, download my app, support a brother. I, I use my own server, you know, no shots. Right. But I, I'm here with my man Gully. I support what he does. Hey, Schoon, whenever, um, whenever you go live, that's all self-sustained within your app? Yes, it is. Yeah. That's dope. That's dope. Um, tell them how they can act. Is that in the app store? Yeah, it's in the app store. It's in the Apple, uh, what is it? Apple and Google Play. Yeah. Uh, I'm getting ready to um to upgrade the app too, you know. I've had it now for about a year and a half. Yeah. Right. We had a um shout out to the district attorney in Queens, man. That's coming from me because I want <laughs> the US attorney, because that was a federal case. Okay, the US attorney. The, the US attorney, shout out to him. Um I wanted a conviction. I grew up on Run DMC and Jam Master J. I don't give a fuck about the accusations or the speculations. <laughs> <laughs> Straight up. He can do no wrong by me, but I have to do that. We have to conduct this dialogue. So first off, could you tell my viewers who you are, where you're from? You know, please. Um, I'm, I'm Curtis Schoon. I'm from Hollis, Queens. Um, I grew up with Run DMC. And uh, unfortunately... In 2002, I was the I was listed as the prime suspect. I was the first person accused of killing Jam Master J. So I've been watching this trial very closely myself. Right. I do know all of the players involved. Right in the well, not all of them. The third suspect, Jay Bryant. I don't know him, and um, nobody I know knows who he is. You know. Right. And he's the guy whose uh, DNA was found on the hat. But I'm gonna let you ask the questions because right. you know I got it. I got I'm a few. You, one of my I'm first questions. You. One of my first questions was: Were you um aware of that fire escape entrance before the trial? Um, I, I didn't even know where the studio was, and right. I, I've said that on record. I've never talked to the police, but I've done enough interviews. See, I'm kind of. I'm a little, I'm a little, I, I don't want to say slick, but I'm smooth with, with mine, right? I say things in interviews that I know they're going to watch and hold me to and, and check on to verify my story. So it was my way of vindicating myself without actually talking to the police directly. Um, I didn't know where the studio was, had never been to it in my life. Um, I hadn't seen Jay maybe for two years prior to when he got killed. Okay. You know, um, I wasn't part of his circle. Um, not not so much by, um, by because of any animosity, but because I just didn't get along with any of the people that Jay surrounded himself with. They weren't good people. And they, look, it proved it, you know? Yeah. Because they're the ones that killed him. Right. Um, prior to this all happening, this is just a general question. Was Jam Master J uh, recognized or known as a hustler in Queens? No. Uh-uh. You know, um, I, I, I'm going to say this as respectfully as possible, right? You know, um, hip-hop has kind of taken over the streets, right? It has, it has hip-hop is like a chameleon. You know, they, they're drug dealers, they're skateboarders, whatever's popping. Hip hop <laughs> becomes that thing. That's true. Um, the, you know, Jay, in my opinion, was a um, he was a, he was a cool dude. He wasn't a tough guy. Um, and when I say tough guy, he wasn't, he wasn't using his will or force. I'm not saying that he was a punk. No, that's not what I'm saying. He wasn't somebody who was known for using pressure tactics or violence. He was a very cool and accepted and respected guy in right. the community, in the neighborhood. But was he one of them dudes that was on the front lines? No. Okay. Well, well, was he? Was he? You know, was he riding for the hood? No. He was. He was just cool. He was that right. guy. You know what I mean? Like he was a cool dude, and that's why Run put him down with Run DMC because really Jay was running these hood paths. That's why they put him down. He knew everybody. They respected him, so Run and D could get acceptance. 
with their affiliation with Jay. When you say he was their hood pass, generally, the because you told me prior, I believe, to run DMC, they didn't go to public school, right? Yeah, they went to Catholic school. I did too, you know, but I lived right in the center of the hood, so I couldn't help but know people. They kind of lived a little bit off, a couple blocks off, right? And run his his first baby mom, uh, Val, his first wife, right? Um, she lived on Jay's block. That's how he really got to know Jay. Did he go to the Jam Master Jay attend Andrew Jackson High School? I'm trying. Yes, to he did. Yes, so he, he did. Knew, yes. So he knew them hood niggas, them street niggas. All the way, Matt, Jay even got jumped by the dudes from from Southside because if you're familiar with Queens at, back in the '80s, um, there was always uh, Hollis Southside beef, you know. And Hollis is a very small hood, right? But um, we we kind of stayed at it with everybody, bigger hoods, all the hoods. We were just like the, the troublemakers in 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 Southeast Queens, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah, right. Where were you the first time you became aware that people were insinuating that you had something to do? Uh, with I was in Queensbridge. I was I was I was subleasing an apartment in Queensbridge. I was down on my I was down on my luck, and I got a call from an individual named Donald Francois. He and I stay in touch to this day. Donald Francois had worked with JMJ at JMJ Records, so he knew the whole staff or whatever. And he called me and he said, yo, man, you heard what they saying about Jay? I said, what? He said, yo, they said Jay dead. They said uh, Jay got shot. And I said, oh, man, that's probably, that's, that's probably some bullshit. Because my opinion of rap, man, is that it's just so extra. You know what I mean? So I, when I heard that he was, he was dead, I didn't believe it. Not because I couldn't believe it. Right. I just, everything associated with hip hop just seems to be over the top and based around marketing. And you know what I mean? So I don't, I take it all with a grain of salt, man. So when he told me that, that's how I received it. And then later on, I found out it was real. And I was like, God damn, what right. the fuck was that about? Little did I know that, um, you know, within 24 hours, they'd be blaming me. I do remember that night hearing Funk Flex on the radio and he was speaking as if it was, you know, People in the music business who had um who had something to do with, with Jay's death. Right. I think he the rumor mill had started and there, there were people who were um accusing, gossiping, mentioning Supreme Griffin, Murder Inc. and all that. And you gotta understand again, man. I see the music business differently, right? I see it as a lot of cosplay, you know. Obviously, now, today, things have changed because back then you had entertainers who pretended to be street guys. And today, I think you've got street guys who are pretending to be entertainers. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Like, you know? <laughs> so, so you got to realize when I'm speaking, uh, you got to put it in the proper context. You know what I mean? But um, right. it, I just felt like, man... When I, when, I, when I heard all of that, I, I couldn't believe it. Um, X was blaming Supreme and Murder, Inc. Because in their world, those were the bad people. Because their world is very encapsulated. It's very small. The truth of the matter is, if you on tour and you in the studio and you making hot records and you got endorsement deals and you had award shows, you don't really know what's going on in the hood. Right. You don't. Yeah. yeah, you don't. You understand? It doesn't mean you're a less of a man. In order to know what's going on in the hood, you got to really be in the hood. You know what I mean? You got to be active, as they say. Right. Right. You know, you. it doesn't mean you won't know anything. You may know something, but you can't go into detail. And I think a lot of people, just by the, the lifestyle that they were afforded in the, in the um, entertainment business, there was a lot of separation between them and what was really going on on the ground level. But because they promote that so much as the culture and that they the voice of the hood, they always have to pretend like they know what's going on when they don't. And I'm saying all that to say, that's the mistake I think Flex made that night. And then the next morning I heard Ed Lover on the radio. I think he was on 105, the morning show, cause they had moved from Hot 97 and he was crying and 
And I was like, man, they they, they taking this really, you know, <clears throat> not just with Jay, but it seemed like people care more about you when you're dead than when you're alive, right? And I'm not saying that none of these people, like these people didn't care about Jay when he was alive, but man, I had no idea that people cared that much about Jay, the way the emotions was coming out, man. You know, yeah, I, I really didn't. I really, really? didn't, man. Really? Really? I, I really run I really DMC. Didn't, run DMC. I really didn't. You know, because I, you know, like I, I come from a place, man, where you're here today, you're gone tomorrow, and, and life goes on. You understand what I'm saying? Like right. people who care, they pay their respects, but life goes on. But these people was acting like this couldn't have happened. Like this was impossible. And if you really, really in the hood, from the hood, you understand it can happen to anybody at any given moment. So that was my mindset. You dig what I'm right. saying? That's right. all. All right. Um, me, I was, I was, I was, I was devastated. I, that was like, I knew the nigga. <laughs> been in my life that long. Like I, I performed proud to be black in third grade for black history month. This, wow. they, they meant a lot to me. Um, I have to, before we go on, there was something that was depicted in the, who killed Jam Master J documentary that I believe yeah. you said wasn't true. They depicted yeah. a scene where you was at the funeral. Could stop yeah. me if I'm if I'm wrong. You was at Keep the funeral. I, I, I got you. Okay, you was at the funeral and you had an encounter with Jay's sister named Nita. Is that her name? The sister name? Yeah, that's it. That was the sister name. She passed away now. She's yep. deceased now. Rest. Yeah, I heard she was deceased. Rest in peace to uh to Nita and Jam Master J. They depicted something that you said didn't happen, right? It, it did happen, but it didn't happen at the funeral. I never went to the funeral. Okay. Um, I yo, I saw Nita a year later because this case really, I feel like it cracked because of me, right? And and I'll tell you why. A year after Jay was dead, I, I showed up in the hood with a writer from Playboy. I pitched the story to Playboy magazine. The writer's name is Frank Owen. And we set up in the barbershop and um, we started getting people to come sit down and talk to him. I was getting the people to do it. And he, he was interviewing them right there in the barbershop. Nita must have heard I was back in the house. It was the first time I was back in the hood since Jay was dead, right? Right. So she walked down to 200 Street where my man Preston Barbershop was. And I seen her and I said, hey, what's up, Nita? And she said, hey, school. Because me and Nita was cool, right? Nita, you know, Nita, and I say this respectfully, Nita's one of those, like, those big girls that's cool with everybody in the hood or houses to hang out. I never hung out in the house. She, you, every hood got some, got a chick like Nita, yeah, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yo. Headquarters. And, headquarters on the block, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and she, she a chick, but she, she got the young chicks around her. And all the dudes is around because of her brother. And you know what I mean? Like they crib, her crib was always open. She's cooking. They they doing whatever they do. I never hung out at their crib ever, but a lot of people did. Anyway, I seen that and I was like, "What's up, Nita? I, how you doing?" She said, "Hey, school." I said, "Can I get a hug?" She said, "No, I can't do that." And I, 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 I that hit me like a slap because so much time a year went by. And a lot of details had already came out that was showing different possibilities. And I just felt like it was a rejection. Now, keep in mind, I'm the person who was falsely accused. And I'm asking her. I, I'm extending the olive branch to her. Right. And she said, no, I can't do that. So I told her, I said, that's all right. You probably hug the person that did it every day. Because anybody that know anything about me know that, you know, I'm quick with it. You know what I'm saying? Like, yo. Anybody tell you that 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 I back down, man? They lying. Please believe that. You understand what I'm saying? Right. I'm taking all challenges from anybody, from everybody, on the spot. So anyway, when she did the documentary, she said that this same exchange happened at the funeral. I would I wasn't going to that funeral. I mean, if they saying I killed the man, why would I be at the funeral? That wouldn't be smart. So I didn't go to the funeral. And even if they didn't say that, I wasn't going to go to the funeral because, like I said, I hadn't seen him or communicated with him in, in two years. He and I wasn't that close. 
we were closer in the past. You know, um, when he first got on, I'll never forget taking Jay to the Diamond District to buy his first baby mother, Lee, some jewelry. I took him to a jewelry store and all that. And, and he was playing uh, uh, Dana Dane for me. I had never heard it. He played music for me. Uh, he put me on to a song out of Cali called Battle Ram that was popping at the time. You know what I mean? Like, he was all right, but things change, man. You know, like I stayed the same as far as my interactions with him. But he, I think he started getting influenced by the people that was around him. People like Big D and um, Randy Allen, you know, people who I've never gotten along with. You never got along with Randy Allen? No, no, no. I, I was I was cool with Randy's older brother. When I say cool, I was cordial with Randy's older brother, Frank, who's now deceased. But Randy, Randy's a um Randy's a strange dude, man. And um he got a lot to answer for. Still. Because really? for me, for me, um Randy has to explain why he obstructed justice. Because you gotta you gotta understand, right? Randy, according to the, the eyewitness accounts, Randy was in the studio in the sound room with an artist. So technically he didn't see what happened. But Randy did a couple things. Randy tampered with evidence by by taking Jay's gun and who knows what else out of the studio. Randy uh got rid of the, the surveillance tape that was in the studio that recorded people. And Randy instructed the two eyewitnesses, Tony Rincon and his sister Lydia Hyde, who actually saw the gunmen when they came in there, not to cooperate with police. Ain't that a you bitch? Know? Ain't that a bitch, punk motherfucker? See? They just reached out to me right before I got on here with you and shit. I'm glad you told me that. I'm glad you told me that. Yo, yeah. Randy got an answer. I, I want Randy to see this. Huh? I want Randy to see this. I told this. them to tune in. I told them to tune in. I told them, fuck I, this I want story. Randy to see this. Tonight. Randy, if you're watching, I'm on your ass, nigga. It ain't over. You know, Jay got his justice, but I got to get mine. You know, and, and that's just what it is. Randy obstructed justice. Randy should be in prison like a motherfucker. I don't understand how, how he escaped all of that. And he's pushing some documentary that he put together. You know yeah, what I mean? Ain't that a bitch? Ain't that a bitch? Yo, yo, listen. Look, man, and, and, and furthermore, you can't convince me that Randy was that scared of Big D to protect his son. So I don't know what's going on between Randy and Big D. But what don't come out in the wash gonna come out in the rinse. It ain't over, Randy. It ain't over. I, I haven't said your name in 20 two years for a reason. But I'm gonna say your name now because the coast is clear. And when I tell you I'm on your ass, I'm on your ass, boy. Yeah, for sure, for right. sure. Right, I'm glad you pointed that out in front of everybody and shit. Yeah, uh, I got no, man, there's, no, there's, no, there's, no, there's no way. Check this out. When we did, when I did the Playboy interview, the beauty of it is, is that the writer spoke to Tenard. And that's the first I ever heard of the 10 kilo deal. Right. That's the first I ever heard of it. When the writer was I, talking to Ten Hag, huh? You said the writer talked you, to Ten Hag. The writer so was talking to, to Ten Hag. He came to the barbershop that day. No, Ten Hag was in jail because Ten Hag got arrested, right? But the writer was doing his due diligence. He's a real journalist. He spoke to Big D. He spoke to Ten Hag. Big D had confided to the writer that. He was indeed a confidential informant, but the writer didn't put that in the article. But Big D, everybody in the hood knew that because he took the stand back like in 84 against Joseph Money Thomas, right? But anyway, once, once I heard the 10 kilo deal, Tenard would not say who they went to Baltimore for to, uh, to give it to, but I already knew who they went to Baltimore for. Because the person that they went to Baltimore for, guess how they got there? I took them to Baltimore. Right. You understand? I took them to Baltimore after they got in trouble in Long Island and needed some place to go, and I took them to Baltimore. So I, I, yo, I knew all of this, right? And I also know this individual when he testified why he had a problem with Jay 
leaving Tenard in Baltimore. Tenard, man, if you really, and Tenard is Ronald Washington for the people listening. Tenard has been in prison. He, he's the same age as I am, 59. He'll be 60 this year. He'd been in prison most of his adult life and a lot of his uh, juvenile life, right? Tenard is a guy that, that has had uh, more experience making love to men than women. This is a guy with no kind of boundaries, no kind of morals, no kind of scruples, capable of anything. You mentioned the, the Who Killed Jam Master J documentary. There was an interview in uh, a person in that in that documentary who was interviewed, and he said uh, something about me and a, a drug deal and this, that, the other. Some some shit that totally didn't happen. The individual David Seabrooks. Tenard paralyzed David Seabrook's cousin. David Seabrook, if he, if he wanted to talk about something, he could have talked about that. Right. And he knows that. You understand what I'm saying? David Seabrook's cousin took Tenard to Baltimore as, as protection while he was hustling. Same type of shit Jay wanted to do with, with the other individual in Baltimore whose name I won't mention, but he testified. His name is in the minutes, whatever. Tenard shot the man in the back of the head and robbed him. So, well, let me say this. I don't know if he shot him, because I didn't see it. But I do know the man got shot in the back of the head, <laughs> and Tenard was supposed to be protecting him, okay? Right. And the man has been paralyzed ever since. And the rumor has it that he wrote Tenard's name with his own blood because he thought he was dying. Now, was he writing his was he writing his name as the emergency contact for when the police showed up? I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. Right. Like they, these people are scumbags, right? This is why I wouldn't rock with Jay. Because I saw the kind of people he had around him. So the individual who they took the, the, the coat to, he saw Tenard, and he testified on the stand and said, when he saw Tenard, he went to go get his gun, and they said, what would you have done if you gotten it? He said, I would have shot him. And he would have. And he absolutely would have, because I know him too. Right. And he wasn't, listen, man, he wasn't, he wasn't acting. If he said that's what he was going to do, that's what he was going to do. And if there's anybody who needed to get shot, it's Tenard. And by the way, when they tried to say it was me and Tenard that did it, people who were really in the streets knew immediately that it wasn't true. People who were in the entertainment business pretended to be from the streets. It all sounds good to them because they don't really know. But people who were really in the streets said that don't make sense. And it didn't because me and Tenard are like oil and water. If you put me and Tenard in a room, you know, only one of us is walking out of there, and the other one is getting carried out. And I'm telling you, ain't nobody carrying me out of nowhere. You understand what I'm saying? Like, tell right. me, look, man, and, and I'll say this, man, the last conversation I had with Tenard may have been around like 1998, right, or 97, somewhere around there. Because I, I had come to New York, and I was staying up in New York, and I had, I had my cars up there. I had a 500 SEL and I had a, a Impala Super Sport. And uh, I was leaving it at my mom's crib because I was staying with a chick in Brooklyn, but I didn't want to have my cars parked on the street in Brooklyn, right? Because your cars is a tip off to where you are and, and how to clock you. So I would leave my cars in Queens at my mom's crib in the driveway. These fools thought that I had something stashed in my mom's house or whatever. Because this is just how the hood is, you know what I mean? We talking about dumb criminals, man. They don't do due diligence. They got all these imaginary thoughts in their head and they, they move on it. So they were planning to run up in my mom's crib and somebody told me about it. I saw 10 hour one morning, early in the morning, like nine o'clock, because I'm walking to the store. You know, it's New York, we walk to the store, we don't ride, you know what I mean? Like, uh, uh, I see Tenard on, on, on the corner. He said, hey, school, I talk to you. I said, yo, what's up, Tenard? He said, yo, man, people are saying that, you know, uh, 
I'm supposed to be doing this and that and the third. But I, I just want you to know, man, that shit ain't true. Niggas just be talking and don't know what they talking about. I said, Tina, listen, you do what you do, man. I said, but I'm going to tell you this. If I ever look out that window and see you in the vicinity, I'm not going to wonder if you're looking for your lost pet or if you're on your way to the bus stop. And he said, he looked at me and he said, understood. And that was the last conversation I ever had with Tenard. Right. You understand? Tenard, Tenard is a dangerous dude, but he's the kind of guy like with Dave's cousin. You can't turn your back on him. As long as you're looking at him, you're good. It's when you turn around, you, you gotta you gotta watch yourself, you know. And, and the crazy shit with, with with this whole case is that they ran to the police with so much misinformation. So they telling the police about some bogus drug deal with me that never happened. They telling the police that Tenard uh had something to do with Stretch's death and all. Look, they painted this picture that the police just knew they had the people that did it. And right. that's why they didn't press the line. And, and what a lot of people don't really understand about criminal cases is that cops, they don't, they don't always solve crimes. They close cases. And when you got dudes with reputations and criminal histories, it doesn't even matter if they really did it or didn't do it. They'll they'll suffice. You understand what I'm saying? Right. Like so, so that, that that's that. Um, but again. You can't tell me that Tony Rincon and Lydia was scared to tell the police that Jay, who provided a livelihood for them, that, that Jay was dead and who did it. You know, and there's a lot of stuff going on with that. So, yes, the Playboy article opened a can of worms with right. the other theories because part of the way police control an investigation is they only leak details to the theory that they're going with. They may hear about other possibilities and suspects, but they're not going to mention that because that only creates reasonable doubt and give anybody who they may charge opportunity to create reasonable doubt right. in a jury trial, right? So you control the information that you disseminate. So once I did the Playboy article, it blew everybody's mind. My lawyer was mad at me because I didn't consult with him. And he was like, yo, you can't do no more interviews unless you talk to me. I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure. But see, I was looking out for me. So that was the first thing, right? The second thing I did was the Breakfast Club in 20, 2017 or 2018. I think it was 20, 20, 2018. Yeah. So I, when, when I did it, uh, um, I mentioned that if the if the police really wanted to crack the case, all they had to do was give Tony Rincon immunity. I said, because he was shot. He obviously wasn't part of the plot. You know, he's a good kid and he ain't hard to find. I mentioned where he worked. I'm not going to say it now because you're on YouTube, they'll flag it. You know what I mean? Right. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mentioned where he worked on the Breakfast Club. And next thing you know, I heard he started talking to police after that the interview that I did. Right. And then they they, they charged Tenard and Lil D. Now, Lil D, I don't know much about him, right? Um, I remember when he was a little kid, but I have no interactions or dealings with him. I know who his father is. His father is a certified piece of shit. And if anything, I want to assume that the fruit don't fall far from the tree. But again, I don't know the kid. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. I can't speak on him in specifics. I know his father, you know, his father's trash. I know his brother got in the jam. He got a brother from a different mother, literally. Um, and that brother had uh, made some statements to the police implicating Lil D. However, when, when it came time for him to um, testify, he refused. They brought him to Brooklyn MDC but whatever he was going through when he decided to flip on his brother, he snapped out of it and he got himself back together. I don't know if dudes in the hood was making this up, but the way they told me, they said that his brother was telling on him so bad, the police wanted to take DNA to make sure they was really brothers. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yo, you said, look, right? 
You describe Pennard as being very dangerous. Yes, he is. Right. Yeah, would that is. be enough? To, would that be enough to freeze Tony for all of those years? To freeze Lydia for all of those years? Uh, Tenard was in jail though, man. Tenard got arrested like a month after Jay got killed. Tenard, okay. I understand this too, and this is the weird thing, right? Uh, Tenard was living in in Jay's childhood home with Nita. He was, I mean, he wasn't living like he was with her in a relationship, but she was running that house, and it was the hood house. You know what I mean? And Tenard was sleeping on the couch in that joint. Yeah. And, and and that's just, you know, again, when I first heard that story about the, the keys in Baltimore, I, I couldn't believe it because, I mean, who would do anything like that with Tenor? Right. You know? But again, we're talking about Jay, right? And he's not really in the mix like that. So he doesn't know. He probably didn't know that Tenor uh, paralyzed Dave's cousin, you know? He probably didn't know, or he probably felt like, you know, he was immune to that because he was Jay or something. You, you, you get what I'm saying? Like, I don't yeah. know what was going through his head, but nobody in their right mind has Tenard around for any reason. Like his whole history. And, and because like, I, I own an outpatient mental health business now, right? So I started looking at things retrospectively, right? And I'm starting to realize that maybe Tenor, this dude might have been bipolar or something because he used to do things that did not make sense. You talk about self-sabotage, that's Tenor. He would do things he could not get away with. Right. That, that made no sense. And that's why he was always in jail. Listen, I wouldn't cross the street with Tenor because I might get a ticket for jaywalking. This is how bad he was. So when I heard that uh, Jay went down there with Tenard, at first I was dismissing it like, no way. But then I got to remember, Jay was really just a cool dude. Maybe he didn't, he, maybe he wasn't privy to the, the level of information that I had, see? And, and I'm, I'm expressing it now because, well, it puts context to a lot of things. But again, Randy got to explain why he involved Derek Parker, the so-called hip hop cop. They were stalling. They were talking about they wanted to uh, go on a witness protection program for who? Big D is washed. You know, Big D is like a, 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 a in a strip club down in Atlanta. The last I heard, you know, like totally washed, man. Yo, I'm gonna tell you who Big D is, right? So Big D, after he told on money, because I think he was facing a two to six on a gun charge, and it might have been the second case or something. So two to something, he was facing a two to six. He told on a dude that he knew that used to be on his block and gave him twenty five to life, right? Big D used to be part of a crew that would rob um, banks, right? I mean, at a young age, at like 19, 20. Tenor's brother, white boy Kev, was part of that crew too. He's deceased as well. Uh, Big D's a girl or son's mother, not, not Lil D, but the other one that was going to tell on Lil D. That girl was in the, in the crew, and she had got caught robbing a bank or something. Big D advised her to cooperate against a dude named Mike Harlem from Hollis. Mike Harlow had been involved in some, some shit and Big D's son mother gave him up and got out of the bank robbery time. Mike Harlow, after doing five years, came home. And this, this had happened, keep in mind, this had happened like in 1980, right? So Dalton's really young, moving heavy, right? This is before crack. This is, you know what I'm saying? like. Dudes, when I tell you, like, my, my hood is really not known for making money. It's really known for taking money, right? And I'm a dude who made money around the takers, so it made me kind of special. You understand what I'm saying? Like, I, I was able to make money around the takers, right? So anyway, 
Mike Harlem came home in five years and he saw Big D, came up on the block. I was there. They talked, they talked calmly and they went around the corner because they were going to shoot a fair one. They went in the schoolyard at 134 and with one punch, Mike Tyson, I mean, I call him Mike Tyson because he was like Mike Tyson. He put Big D lights out. You know, nowadays you knock somebody down, they say, oh, yo, he knocked them out. No, a knockout is when you are totally unaware of your surroundings. And when I looked through the fence, I saw Big D on his back with his toes pointing at the moon. <laughs> he, he, he was he out was cold, right? If you listen, he might have been, well been on the beach in Miami or something. Right. So anyway, <laughs> yo, Mike Harlan was taking out his joint, getting ready to piss on him to wake him up. And somebody jumped like to stop it. You understand? Because Mike was, yo, he was that mad. You know what I mean? But this is Big D taking L's. Big dude working for Leo Cohen at Rush Management. Uh, a thief was stealing money from the artist. Big D was the VP at Rush Management under Leo and Russell because of Jay. And this is after he took the stand against money, right? He was stealing money from the artists. And Big Daddy came, he had a, a, some dude named Anthony or something from Brooklyn. They came up to the studio. And you gotta understand, this is before everybody had cell phones and all of that. And the same dude, Donald Francois, that had called me the night, he was working over there. He told me, he said, man, he heard a ruckus in the room with Big D, cause they went in there, closed the door. When they opened the door, Big D was out cold. And infinite had infamous uh infinite had the desk phone and smacking big D in the head with it to try to wake him up, right? You know, like he, you know like how you knock somebody out, then you try to knock him back in. Yeah. yeah, but that's what they was doing to him. As big as big D is, every time I hear his name, it's like it's like night night. You know, keep your butt cheeks tight. He's out cold. Right. Somebody always laying his ass out, bro. And you can't tell me that Randy and and, and, and the rest of them were scared of that dude. You can't tell me that, man. You just can't. His reputation was gone. His connections were gone. All of that. Little D was 17 years old at the time. Do you know in, in like May of 2003, the same Little D was charged with shooting Jay's nephew, Bo? Bo Skaggs. Yeah, he was charged with it. I, um, you know, nothing ever happened. No, nothing ever happened. I think Bo didn't want to press charges. What would cause them to get right? into a conflict? What would cause them them two to get into a conflict? Well, uh, no, 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 no speculation. Um, I think the dude named was Chris Black from the Cash Money Brothers with Ja Rule, the group that they first had. Um, Something happened and he punched Lil D in the mouth and, and broke his jaw. And Bo, being the rapper that he is, he had mentioned something like that. He referenced that shit in the song. And Lil D like, yo, he's a little impulsive little cat. Like I said, I don't really know him, but the last, the only time I was around Lil D was when he was about five or six years old. And we was in Palo Alto in California and Run DMC was performing at the amphitheater out there. And, uh, the run had turned off the lights to pray before he got on stage. And the dude, Lil D, at five, six years old, all I remember was him saying, turn on them damn lights. And I was like, yo, this kid, you know, he, yo, he wild. You know, like, it was quiet and dark, you know, run with his, with his preacher bullshit. And uh, the, little, the little fella like, was like, turn on them damn lights. You know, I, I almost cried laughing in there, you know what I mean? But it gave you a glimpse of his personality. He, do, he does seem to be impulsive. Now, that doesn't mean he's a killer. Right. But he, he had behavioral issues, for sure. So you know what he, I'm he popped both for rapping about him being knocked out. Yeah, for getting his jaw broke. Yeah, for oh, sure. Shit broke. And he, yeah, he didn't get knocked out. Big D's father got knocked out. He just got his jaw broke. Like I said. The fruit don't fall far from the tree, bro. Right. You know? Yeah. Right. The um the whole time 
Big D remained closer, close to Run DMC's camp because, of course, he appeared on the Jam Master J documentary, right? What do you, what do you think about that? I, I don't know. I know he was a pole bearer. See, Big D was was close to um, he was close to Jay, right? He was close to Jay. I knew Big D had took my name to the DA's office and to Leon. I had assumed that he did it because he really believed that that Randy had told him my name for whatever reason. See, the fact that I, I felt like Randy was the source of my implication, I had to wonder why. And you know, a lot of this shit I just didn't see. It does. It shit still don't make sense to me. But why lie on me? You know, if Tenard and, and Lil D were the ones that went in there, why are you trying to protect Lil D? Now, what Tenard did, Tenard's a wild boy because after I ran my Playboy play, Tenard solicited a, 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 a article with Maxim. Maxim. And the writer, the writer name was Michelle McPhee. And in, in that joint, what Tenard says is that he saw... Lil D and Big D going into the studio in the front door and coming out the back. Now, who the hell is going to put themselves at the front and the back door? But that, that's why I tell you, I think Tim is a little, you know, he's a little scooby. You understand what I'm saying? He ain't the sharpest knife in the drawer. This is this is for sure, right? But um, right. Th so this this what Tim also told the Queen's DA. Because when he got arrested, he had committed several armed robberies. Because obviously, if they were saying he was involved in Jay's death, he couldn't go back to the couch in Jay's sister's house. So he was homeless. And he was he committed several armed robberies. And he got caught after a high-speed chase. He robbed the Floral Park Motel. Um, and he's a, a persistent felon. He, he had already had like three felonies. They could have given 10 or 25 to life in New York, right? However, right. however, he worked out a deal and he got seven years. My other question is, if Tenor tells the DA he saw Big D and Lil D commit the crime and they give him a deal based on his time, I mean, his testimony, why didn't they prosecute? Why didn't they prosecute Big D? And Little D, correct. Right. And they never did. Right. And what the feds did was they waited until it was almost time for Tenard to be released. And they came and charged him under federal guidelines. And that's how they held him all this time. Otherwise, he'd have been out like 12 years ago. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Like, Let me yeah. ask you something, Scoon. Why was, um, why was this a federal case? Well, uh, you know, the, the feds they got certain certain guidelines that they they can um, follow. For instance, if you're a felon in possession of a handgun, right, the feds can pick it up, but they don't always pick it up. Yeah, any felon who has a, a firearm can be prosecuted under the federal law. And um, sometimes in some states, if you're on your third felony, you know, like I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not 100 clear on it. But like Tut out of Brooklyn, he's in the feds for doing crimes in New York because they impose federal statutes on you if they really want to get you out the way. You know, he had already gotten away with shooting a cop, so they look at certain people and be like, "Nah, this is too much for the state because we can hit them harder under federal guidelines." And they do; they find a way to charge you under the federal guidelines, right? And, and and that's what they did with Tenard. They came and got him before he got out, and I don't know exactly what his charges were, right. but they put him on ice, and they kept him there until they was ready to cook him, and that's what they did. Do you think because of, um, I, didn't, I didn't hear that Uncle testified. I never heard that. No, he think? didn't testify. And I, I'll, I'll speak on that, you know? I got you. Hold on, hold on. Do you think because of Tony being an eyewitness and him and Lydia because of their testimony, they no longer needed to speak to uncle. Listen, this is, first of all, let me say this about two, three years ago in 2021, I think it 
think, or maybe 2020, after these dudes got arrested, the U.S. attorney reached out to my attorney and they wanted to talk to me under the conditions of immunity, excuse me. And I, I wouldn't do it. And um, I'll tell you why I wouldn't do it. Because one, like I told you earlier, I didn't know where the studio was. So I, I definitely had nothing to do with it, right? So I couldn't tell them anything about it. I still don't know. I got more questions than answers now, right? So why would they want to talk to me? Well, they wanted to establish that, that Jay was a drug dealer. And because the story about some drug deal with me and him was out there, they needed me to verify that he was a drug dealer, even though I couldn't provide motive for that, this specific crime, right? Because they right. needed to paint a picture of him, right? The problem with that is the only way I can uh, verify that he was a drug dealer is to incriminate myself. Even though they weren't going to prosecute me, once it's in the record, it's in the record. So I'm, anybody can pull it up and says, yo, he said this, that. You know, not getting prosecuted is no deal. If you on if you under oath incriminating yourself in ways that could be used against you and God knows when in the future, right? Right. For the for the record, I've never sold drugs. I've never held a gun. I've never even fired one. Right? I don't I don't break the law. I don't have any convictions, right? So you're not gonna get me to sit here. That's why I'll be looking at these old dudes, these old wash dudes that get on all these podcasts talking about all the drugs they sold and the time they did in prison. And I'm just like, really? You 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 that fucked up? That now this is what you're proud of? <laughs> like, yo, you gotta be kidding me. You understand what I'm saying? Like, who admits this type of shit? You know what I mean? Like, yo, like how many. How many people are going to make a movie about your life? Nobody. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, you know, look, I'll be watching them, man. These dudes really, be, they're comical to me, right? And I'm talking about the older cats from my era, right? Right. They get on these podcasts and talk about all, all of the celebrities they hung around. They used to be with Bobby Brown. Bobby Brown was a crackhead. If you was hanging with Bobby Brown, you was either smoking crack with him or selling crack to him. You can't act like that was your homie when everybody knows that this dude been smoking crack forever. You understand what I'm saying? Like, yo, like how you a gangster but you, your homie is a crackhead? Like, like I, I be watching these podcasts and I be watching these dudes that's supposed to be my peers. And I'd be like, man, they so lucky that the audience is just too young to know any better. You understand what I'm saying? You, yo, anybody who's running around, and this is an awful the J thing for us, but I just got to get this off my chest because the, the internet and these young people, they watch these dudes and they really believe this bullshit. Like these niggas are only telling these stories because the people who really matter, Eva, quiet and not going to say anything or they're not around they're in jail or dead so the people that's left behind now they get to tell it like they were the center of attention yeah. and and they they really weren't you understand what i'm saying they really weren't man and furthermore i i'm not one of them people that have given up on winning that i start glorifying losing I see what you You understand what I'm saying? Like, yo, I needed yo, that bro. portion of this. I needed you to construct this last two, three minutes. I needed that nice little... Yeah, man, I'm, I'm not one of them guys that has <laughs> that have given up on winning to the point that, uh, you know, I glorify losing. And if I'm going to let my nuts hang, let me let my nuts hang, right? right. I, look, man, I don't talk about the 80s, the 90s, none of that. You know why? Not because I wasn't a factor. Look, man, I've been around things that people talk about that I don't forgot about until somebody else reminded me because it's not that important to me, right? 
I don't help the dude get elected in office. I, I was the number one backer for Coleman Young when he ran for mayor in 2017. Then I backed him when then I backed him when he ran for Congress in 2018. Then I backed him when he ran for, for city council in 2021. Even made commercials for him. He's in office right now. Yo, I I'm the executive director of the Coleman Alexander Young Foundation that teaches STEM in, in Detroit public schools, right? That's what I'm talking about. I, I own an outpatient mental health facility in Washington, D.C. I hire about 20 W-2 workers and 40 contractors. That's what I do here. I'm an independent filmmaker. That's my hobby. I make films. I don't run around crowdfunding, da 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 da. I pay for my own shit and get it done. I got my own media site on my own server, School TV, with my own app. And it's, it's news. I interview political giants. You know what I mean? Like, that's what I do, man. And when I see cats my age talking about some shit they was doing when they was 25. All that tells me is that they didn't grow. They didn't get out the way, man. You know, and it's bad when, when grown men and women want to occupy adolescent spaces because it leaves the kids nowhere to go. Hmm. You, you dig what I'm saying? Yeah. Right. And that's why there's so much enmity between young and old people because the, the young people is like, man, y'all just need to just move on. Yo, when when you when, when you go get out the way, and what what they mean is not really like get out the way, go lay down and die, graduate, move up. Right. Like these are like a lot of these dudes that be running around talking, telling their gangster stories and shit. They like super seniors in high school. You know that guy that never graduated, and he's like twenty five and he's a senior, <laughs> but he see he seems like the coolest dude because he knows everything. He knows all the teachers. He knows all, everybody in the community. Of course he does, because he's been here too long. And that's how I see a lot of these like hood legends. And and and, and while we own it, man, I don't know what your relationship is with Vlad, but I got Vlad's first TV production credit. Vlad has asked me to be on his show several times, and I said no. Because I see Vlad as somebody who doesn't help the culture. He's someone who exploits, exploits. the dysfunction in A the culture. Black culture. Black culture. Yes. 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 I, he profits from it. Yes. And, and you know, he, yo, man, he does what I what I call all the, the interlopers, um, what they call them, culture vultures. You see, it's a four-step process. It's infiltrate, assimilate, dominate, then dictate. And that's that sound how they like move. J that sounds like J. Edgar Hoover. Yo, bro, that's that how they like move. J. Edgar bro. Hoover shit. That's, that's how they all move. It could be what the boy, uh, no jumper. They all the same. Yeah. Yo, and when they really want to double down on it, get him a black wife like Vlad did. You understand? That's how they, that's they, they're really cool. You know what I mean? Like, yo, he, he, he's cool. He got a black wife. Man, white men have been having access to black women forever. It means nothing. Okay? It means nothing. It doesn't prove anything. Right. Okay. But let's get back to Jam Master J. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you dropped that off on me. Look, right? Can you share with the, the, uh, the listeners who uncle it's speculated to be and his relationship to this case. Well, let, let, let's take it back here, right? Um, if somebody gave Jay 10 kilos in August of 2002 and he got killed in October of 2002 and the, the motive is over a drug deal, then why in the world are the police talking about something that possibly happened 10 years prior? It doesn't make sense, right? Unless they're protecting this individual who gave them the tankies. Now, 
I'm not going to say his name. And the reason why I'm not going to say his name is because he wasn't called to testify. But I know for a fact that he had to go see the uh, the U.S. attorney with his lawyer, he, with his lawyer, his attorney, and he got subpoenaed. And I know I don't know what he said. He found a way not to have to take the stand. But you got to ask you. I suspect he's still working. Right. Me too. Me too. Fucking right. I suspect he's still working, and that's why they didn't put him on the stand. But I know who he is. He's from the Midwest, and he came home in 2020. You know, right, I, I think right before these guys got charged, he came home like in March. And he's from the Midwest. Yeah. And his name is not Uncle, and they've been protecting him the whole time. And the reason why they wanted me to verify that Jay was dealing in drugs, because they didn't want to have to use him, because they had to protect him. So, so when I when I when I declined to to, to get questioned with uh, under immunity, it put them in a tough spot. But they managed to get get what they needed anyway without putting him on front street. But if he's watching, just know that I know, and so do a lot of other people. Yeah, we like know, brother. nigga. You got out of jail way too early for a thirty year kingpin case. We know. <laughs> Yo, look, you know. So I, I mean, my my thing is like you know. It's not like anybody's going to do anything, right? Because we live in an era where people are buying credibility, right? If you got a, like a, a Rolls Royce Phantom or whatever the cause is, I can't even keep yeah, up. You the nigga now, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because now you can buy what you had to be, what you had to earn. You dig what I'm saying? So everybody got chains, diamonds. Everybody's tough. The hood is just anywhere you see black people. You know, I, that's just what it is. And, and that's why, I, yo, man, it's a good thing that I'm 59, about to be 60 and not 30, because I would get myself in a lot of trouble, because it's real sweet out here. It is. Even though like, dudes is wilding out, they still ain't even got no real tactics with them. They crashing out. They not wilding out. You understand what I'm saying? Like, right. There's no real technique to none of it. Not that I know anything, you know what I'm saying? I'm just sitting around watching. I'm like, man, it doesn't change a little bit. But it, it is what it is. But, yeah, Randy Allen, let's get back to Randy. Yeah. Randy yeah. got an answer for that. He got an answer for that. To protect those people if those are really the people that did it. You know, Tony, they said Tony was crying the whole time he was on the stand. The jury felt like he was, um, was very credible. I, I know it's tough to beat eyewitness testimony, right? So the minute I heard that two, two eyewitnesses, yo, the minute I heard that so two people said that they, they identified those guys, I was like, I kind of expected it to, to be just the way it is. Now let me say this: some confusion should happen in the case. I don't know who Jay Bryan is. Nobody I know knows who's Jay, who Jay Bryan is. Jay Bryan's hat was found at the crime scene with his DNA in it, right? However, Ned, uh, Lydia nor Tony mentioned anything about a third suspect. I, so I don't know. They got him on ice. They're going to they're gonna prosecute him. I suspect now that they got the conviction on these two, they're probably going to offer Jay Bryan some kind of cop out and just get him out the way. You know, they, they got what they wanted, right. they, the conviction. They got what they wanted. They got the conviction. And they're probably going to give Jay Bryant a cop out. Now, also, Jay Bryant's uncle, Raymond Bryant, took the stand. And he said that Jay Bryant confessed to him that he was the one that did it. Did he make that up? I don't know. I don't know what the hell is going on. Tinard's girlfriend said that Tinard confessed to her that he was the one that did it. Look, man. This is a real shit show. You understand? But they got their conviction. Um, Tenard is the one that brought it to the attention that there was a drug deal going on in Baltimore and that Jay was selling drugs. And they brought the person who Jay brought the drugs to. Now, I don't have the minutes. I'm going to get the minutes. I don't know if it was ever disclosed whether the drugs were sold. Yeah, what I was going to ask you that. I was going to ask you that. What happened to the bricks? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know because allegedly, um, 
I I initially thought that someone ran off with it, right? But based on the story that came out, it looked like Tenard and Lil D were mad that they didn't get something. You know, I look, I have no idea, man. I gotta read the minutes. I wanted to go to the to the court, right? Right. But I didn't I didn't want I didn't want them to see me in the courtroom and then try to subpoena me. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> so I said, I, I said, I'll be trying my hand a little too much. Yeah, don't, 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 don't go sitting in on no federal cases, man. Don't yeah, come on now. You know, they, 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 had, they had an old boy who ended up testifying who Jay took the coaching. They went and got him in Kansas City. And um, he was in jail for like a week before he decided to, to take the stand. They they claimed that he was a material witness or something, and they was locking him up for his own good, for his protection. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. So that that's what that is, man. But we we gonna see. Big D, I you know I just feel like with him, he was trying to protect his, his son. His son. It's clear that Big D swapped his son out with me. If it was indeed Tenard and Lil D, Big D said it was me and Tenard. Tenard said it was Big D and Lil D. You know what I mean? Like, and and, and I think what Tenard did was when he realized because they were trying to kill Tenard too. They yeah. were. They absolutely were. What well, on the streets after this shit happened? Niggas trying to bust their My my suspicion is, um, whoever was behind it wanted to kill Tenard. And myself, you know, I heard that there was money on my head at the time, but um, I moved different, man. Uh, you know, I moved different. You, I don't make it easy for nobody. You understand what I'm saying? Like, and when I say that, you know, a lot of people, right? They gonna be out in the club in the VIP. <laughs> you heard what I said earlier. I was staying in Brooklyn, would leave my cars in, in Queens. Right. Like right. I move like that. I move like that all the time, bro. Right. I'm not making it easy for nobody. Not the law, not not the motherfucking outlaws, nobody. You dig what I'm saying? Like, you know, and that's just what it is. It's just a way of life for me. What is a um a federal murder one conviction that's life? I I don't know. I read that they're facing uh 20 no less than 20 years, right? No I'm not sure. I, I know Lil D got some drug charges too. That And that's also how the feds kind of like tied it in with him because they were doing th things out of state, across state lines, and they made it all part of a continuing criminal enterprise, I believe, you know? Yeah. Wow. But for me, you know, no, no, no offense to Jay or anything. I'm glad his family got their justice, if, if indeed they satisfied with that. But for me, I'm trying to figure out how the hell did I get in this? You, you understand? And I still don't have that answer. Right. And that's why I, I need Randy Allen. And never received, no, never received no apology from the family or nothing like that? Nobody. I mean, look, man, I don't even, um, I, I'd be lying to you if I said I wasn't tight about that before. But I just come to understand that we're dealing with with simple people that just like to talk. And I'm I'm generalizing here. I'm not talking about anyone in particular. You know, when you're dealing with the hood, man, everybody want to talk like they know. And most of the times they don't really know. No. And and you know, when when they make a mistake, they don't own up to that shit at all. They just keep moving, you know, to the next crime scene. Yeah. And, and and go fuck that one up. You know what I mean? Like, yo, know, the wild shit about the hood is that when I see dudes that um that spent thirty years in prison, wrongfully convicted, and everybody telling me, "Yo, man, that's messed up," I be like, "But y'all the ones that did it to him. Y'all the ones gossiping. Y'all the ones giving the police wrong information, and then thirty years later, you talking about, man, that's jacked up, man. They need to they need to pay that man." If y'all would just shut the fuck up and let the police do their job, and if if you really, if you really like that, handle your business. Don't gossip. 
If you about street justice, I respect it. Then get to it. Let's, let's talk it. Handle your business. There's no reason why the killers of Jay were so close to him. And nobody who said they was cool with him got to the bottom of it. For the police went into their roadblocks. But y'all supposed to be from the hood, right? Instead of all this gossiping and doing interviews on documentaries, yo, man, it's time to corner some people, take them down in the basement, Get and busy. come upstairs with some answers. Get busy. Yeah. You understand? Let me tell you something, man. And, and this is no, this is not a boast or anything. But if it was my man, we would have got to the bottom of this a long time ago. There wouldn't have been no goddamn uh, documentaries. Wouldn't have been no need for it, you know? Um, and speaking of documentaries, I got to get at this dude too. Steve LaBelle. Getting. Culture Vulture. Getting, getting. Cult Culture Vulture. You know that, that who killed Jam Master J was Steve LaBelle who facilitated. Oh, oh, stop, hold, stop. That wasn't done by black folks. Was there any documentary done by black folks? Haitian Jack speaks. I directed that. I'm black. No, I'm talking about. I'm talking about uh, regarding Jam Master J. I'm fucked up that 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 was that white people was behind that. I'm fucked up about but, that. But but ain't they behind usually all of these like big push documentaries? Like that's what they it's do. It's a shame that someone Is else it? again profited profited from that. Look, man, we like color. we like to be in front of the camera. We like to be on magazine covers. They own the magazines, they put us on the cover. They own the production studios, they put us in front of the camera. And, you know, for us, fame is our currency. Ha, huh. not everybody, but I get it. Yeah, That's you know. shit. That's some nigga shit. Niggas been paid with fame for a long time now. Fame is our currency, man. Uh, you know, I'm not speaking about me, you know, but shit. It, it just is what it is. It's why old dudes is always on these podcasts talking about how many pies they used to flip <laughs> and, and who they was locked up with. Yo, you know what's one of the fascinating things to me? is all these dudes on YouTube with prison stories, right? And I'm just like, yo, who the hell is watching this shit and why? Do you plan on going to prison? <laughs> 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 yeah. I did a couple, but that was it. I wasn't about to flood my channel with that bullshit. Yo, I, bro. Some niggas spent their whole life in jail, man. It's like some niggas don't man. have no other experiences to talk about. But I, no, I, I understand. I try not to judge them niggas, but it kind of make niggas look dumb. It do. Hey, 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 yo, Gully, look, I ain't mad at the content providers. I'm just wondering who's tuning into this shit religiously. These niggas mm -hmm. in my chat be watching that shit. Yo, I'm just like, why? Why? Yeah. Why? You know what I mean? Like, they don't care. You they don't care. The jail? They don't care. They watch our son. They watch Jake. What's his name? 1090 Jake. They don't. Have, they just want content, man. They don't have no fucking attitude. Yeah, it, 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 it's, but the, the prison stories in particular. Look, man. There's one dude that I'm not gonna say his name. He came across my feed and he was talking about what it's like in Florence ADX Supermax, and I'm just like, fucking I can't. <laughs> 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 and they be asking for donations. Oh well, I get all of that. And they be asking it. for cash app donations and shit. But yeah. listen, man, again, I'm not mad at the guys doing it, right? Because that's all they got, right? Yeah. I'm just wondering who's sitting around watching all this shit all the time, man. And I'm look, I'm looking at this dude, man, and this dude is like, he's talking about. Nah, I mean, and I'm just like, yo, this dude is like my, like, I know this guy, right? He's my age, right? And I'm just like. Yeah. I think um, content about corrections is something about it that's interesting. I asked myself that once 
when I was in the state penitentiary, me and my celly was in, you know, we locked in for the night, eating, you know, doing our thing. And we watching Lock Up. Lock Up was a big TV show, the niggas in jail. Like, that's <laughs> kind of strange. Why would a motherfucker in jail want to watch content about other motherfuckers in jail? But it, it was, I don't know. I don't know. Let, let me tell you, let me share something with you, Dolly. Um, I one time I was up there on, on, on like one one thirty nine in Lenox, right? And it was a dude that lived in the buildings over there. I went up in there with my man, and they was watching. Um, what was the show called? Oz. Oh, Oz! That was my shit. Yeah. But, oh, yeah. Listen, but check this out though, right? I had never watched Oz before. Within the first five minutes, there was two male frontal nudity scenes. I was like, yo, man. I was like, I was like, I said, come on, man. man. Like, this is these weird old dudes in Hollywood pretending they making a movie about jail just so they can see dude Schlong swinging and shit <laughs> all over the place. <laughs> yo, 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 yo. yo, look, man. Yo, I'm not partaking in any of this foolishness. Get this shit off my screen, man. I don't want to see this. You know, there's certain you have to care about what you let into your consciousness, man. Somebody in here just said something about Oz. I like the Oz. Um, Poet was in Oz. I believe he's deceased now. Lord Jamar was in Oz. LL Cool J was in Oz. It was just something. I like the Oz, but go ahead. Go, go. Yo, bro. I only, look, I, listen, again, I'm just me, right? right? I'm just saying, within the first five minutes of me seeing Oz, I saw two male frontal nudity scenes. <laughs> and that was, that was enough for me. I <laughs> <laughs> That was just too much, bro. It was just too much. Shout out just to BC. Shout out to BC. But we going to move on. <laughs> Soon, <laughs> tell my viewers um, how they can go about getting the app because they loving your um, they loving your narrative. You got a lot of wisdom. And you strong. You obviously strong. Black and strong. And I, I, I appreciate that on my platform again. But go ahead, tell them where they can find you. I tell them where they can get one of them dope ass t shirts at. Oh, and I'm gonna need you to send me one too. Schooltv.com. That's my that's my news site. There's no celebrity stuff. I deliberately don't let me say this. I don't have anything against celebrity, but I just feel like we have so much celebrity content. I wanted to do something different. So there's a lot of international news on school TV. Okay. It's a news aggregator and a pay journalist to write exclusive content in my town hall section. Ho, oh, you said you pay journalists to write. I'm nice. Where my pen at? <laughs> I'm nice. I'm nice. Where do I send my resume? I'm nice, man. We, we got, we got, I'm going to send you the info, right? So, yeah, and, man. So, so, <laughs> so now, also, um, the app, School TV app, is in the uh, Apple Store and Google Play. Just put in School TV, you'll see my profile. My face my, is the logo. And um, you can download the app. The purpose of the app is not only just to see the content, the news, but every Tuesday at 8 o'clock, most Tuesdays, I'm doing something else. Like I might be in Detroit next week, I'm not sure. Um, I do a live stream from like 8 o'clock to 9.30 every single Tuesday, and it's free. The app is free. Right. I do have paid subscribers because I conduct interviews. I got a, um, a show called Rule of Law that I post where I interview Judge Joe Brown, and that's behind my paywall. And I, I do vlogs every week where I talk on every, uh, about everything. There's a vlog up right now where, where I'm talking, you know, I'm dealing with the Nation of Islam and um, Savior's Day and all that stuff. You can check that out. Um, my Twitter is at school TV or at Curtis School. If you go to at Curtis School, you'll see my pin tweet, and it's a trailer for my uh, first episode of my boxing docuseries, Born to Box. Visit bornabboxfilm.com. When did to that drop? Out. I'm very interested in that joint. Uh, Luke was telling me a lot about it, and I love oh, boxing. Oh, 
Oh, the joint, the joint is fire. You know what I mean? And again, I don't, I don't crowdfund. I'm not knocking it. I just, I pay for everything I do. And if I can't pay for it, I wait until I can pay for it. A lot of us, we have all these expectations and these grandiose dreams, and we expect other people to finance it. And it's <laughs> That's some nigga shit. Hold on. <laughs> Crowdfunding. Is that panhandling? Is, is that a fancy word for panhandling? Cyber begging, all that. You know Cyber but, begging, crowdfunding. So, I got it. <laughs> look, yeah. man, my, my, my thing is this, right? We do what we can until we can do what we want, right? Right. And you start off small. You know, when you come on SchoolTV.com, no, it's not Bloomberg, no. But it's I own it. I have my own survey. And the reason why I did it is because um, in 2021, when they kicked Trump off of Twitter, I said, oh, shit, because they were censoring what people said. Yeah. They do it on Instagram. They do it on Facebook. So it was important for me to have my own server where I could say what I want and do what I want. I do have the other platforms because, of course, I use it to try to drive traffic to my site. I've interviewed uh, Roger Stone, who was in the White House with Nixon. He's the one that got Trump um, elected in 2016. I interviewed uh, Roger Stone. I interviewed Dudazani Zuma, the son of Jacob Zuma in the AMC. He was the, uh, Jacob Zuma was the president of South Africa. I've interviewed Mark Lamont Hill. The show Rule of Law that I have that uh, I do with Judge Joe Brown, it's a it, it's a regular. Anything legal going on in the headlines, I interview Judge Joe with, Brown. You got a show with Judge Joe Brown? Yeah, Judge, Judge is my legal, he's my legal analyst for school TV. The judge is my man. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that me, I, I I call the judge, be like, yo, judge, we need to do a show on such and such. Like we did something with Fannie Willis in Atlanta. You see, I'm not a grown man trying to occupy the kids' lane. I'm gonna let the kids have the kid, have to have the kid lane. They're entitled to make their mistakes and do their fun stuff and all that. I'm not gonna knock them for it because I want to be in their spot. I'm not that guy, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yo, yeah, you just got to grow, man. Again, to all the old dudes, man. Yo, give it a rest. Find something <laughs> age appropriate to do, man. Like, yo, look, <laughs> yo, look I, I, I've been out there forever. I mean, shit, I, I, could, I could say some things, but I don't even care about none of that shit, man. I, I did the books. I did journalism. Keep in mind, I haven't been formally trained in anything, right? Now, think about this. If I'm doing these things that I'm doing without any formal training, imagine when I was applying that kind of mindset to the hood. And this is why I'm not impressed with any of these dudes that they holding up as some kind of beacon of, you know, this is what the hood should be like. I'm just like, really? This dude here, are you serious? Hmm. Schoon, you've been a wonderful guest. They really enjoy you. I, um, tell them where you at on, on Instagram, and I'm going to get up out of here. And I want to meet Judge Joe Brown and shit. Go, go ahead. All right. We go to Memphis. Look, because that's where he live. Um, I'm at Schoon TV on Instagram, Schoon TV on Twitter, Curtis Schoon on tw uh, Twitter, Curtis Schoon on Facebook. Um, SchoonTV.com is my site and go download that app and come chat with me free every Tuesday at 8 o'clock man we chop it up but we talk about politics life and yo man I'm about the black man black woman too but see the black community stands on the shoulders of the black man you know you build a, the black man is the foundation for a strong black community and the strong black community is the foundation for a strong black nation. But it starts with us, the men. You know, don't let these people fool you and let them put the women in front of us. And look what they're doing to the women now. Claudine Gay over there in Harvard, Fanny, Fanny Willis in Atlanta, Latoya Cantrell in New Orleans, Tiffany Henyard in, in, in Dalton, <laughs> Illinois. They just crushing them. They, they it's like they build them up because they don't have us to protect them. They put them out there 
and got them drinking their own Kool-Aid and believing their own hype. And then they leave them on their own to take all that punishment. You see what I'm saying? They was running to my yes and all this other shit. What they, nah, were, saying, what they were saying? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, <yo. laughs> cool man i appreciate you man i gotta get up out of here man oh, oh, back to me. i appreciate you again this is gonna do wonderful rest in peace to jay. All right, bro. Jay. rest in yes. peace to master jay i'm 100 on jay's side school i don't give a fuck what go down Look, rest in peace jam master jay i'm saying it too bro no doubt I'm up out of here, man. Y'all enjoy y'all night. School and I'll be in touch. Okay. Later. Peace.